Falcha, welcome back to Irish Granny Tarot. This is part four of our book, The Truth and the Light by Peter and Elizabeth Fenwick. This is an exploration of near-death experiences. Chapter 14, let's be rational about this. So near-death experiences, as we've said, seem to, to transcend culture, time, religion. Uh, the scientific explanation is that uh, the mind and the brain are the same thing. My husband has pulled yarn on this. Mm -hmm. The mind and the brain are the same thing and uh, it's all just a reflection of brain function and that near-death experiences are all about brain processes. And some people say now, wait a second, this is not a sufficient explanation. There are too many contradictions. Uh, Goethe said that, this is a quote, mysteries are not necessarily miracles. <laughs> that we do tend to hunt for mystical explanations often and that there may just be a lack of scientific understanding of what's going on. Uh, we know that messages are taken in by the sense organs and delivered to the brain and that the brain creates a model of the world. These messages are coded and their pulses, coded pulses, they're sent to specific areas of the brain to be decoded. And uh, there's a condition called synesthesia, really interesting, where these pulses get leaked to the wrong area of the brain and therefore you may Hear, hear music but see it as colors as well or smell it as pleasant smells uh, senses get all mixed up it's because different parts of the brain the wrong parts of the brain are being stimulated so all of the input is switched to our attention in the cortex of the brain if you think of your dog you get an image in the image part of the brain but you also think of the name of the dog or a dog in the verbal part of your brain and that's a completely different part of your brain and all of that has to be synthesized. Damage to a particular area will affect your perception and uh, so you, that you'll, if a certain part of your brain is injured, for example, and you hear music, it won't sound like music, it'll sound like noise. Or you hear speech, you can't make sense of the words if a particular area is damaged. So to make full consciousness, the brain has to integrate all of its parts. They can't have damage. Uh, they have to all be working together. The brain scans how, oh, brain scans show how um, that if you imagine something, an appropriate area of your brain is activated, having to do with what you're thinking about. So the, to the brain, experiences that arise from the mind are just as real as those that ex are experienced from the outside world. So you think of a dog, I'm making this up. You think of a dog, this part of your brain is activated. You see a dog, this part of the brain is activated. How is that possible? How is a thought, your mind, doing the same thing as your sensory organs would do and you come up with the same thing, the dog? How is that possible? Uh, the brain actively tags the real outside experience as real, so you know the difference between, oh, I'm thinking of it, I made it up in my head, or that actually happened. So that's how we can tell things are not imaginary. Our brain is actually telling us, hey, this is real, this is imaginary. Uh, the mechanism for creating the dream world, um, it's really not different. In a dream, your muscles are inhibited from acting. So you essentially are paralyzed so that you don't act out your dreams. So that if you dream about jumping out a window, you don't get out of bed and jump out the window. And often in a near-death experience, there is a similar sort of paralysis. Damage to the brain affects your 
dreams. So remember I talked about the woman who had damage to her brain from a stroke, didn't recognize faces in real life and in her dreams, people didn't have faces. Very interesting. But what happens in the unconscious people, and this is where it really gets interesting in unconscious people having near-death experiences, they've had a stroke, that part of the brain is damaged. In real life, they don't recognize faces. But during their near-death experience, everybody has faces and they recognize them. So if we're unconscious, we're not taking in sensory codes. Our eyes are shut. Sometimes we can't hear. We aren't building models. We're experiencing nothing. However, sometimes we're building models, but we have no memory. So for example, the perfect example is an alcoholic blackout. You're taking in stuff, but you have no memory of it because the alcohol uh, has a catastrophic effect on memory. It, in, it interferes with putting down memory. If you're unconscious, you can't even build the model. If you're unconscious drunk, you know, if you're drunk, blackout, you're still taking things in, in the sensory way, making models. But you have nowhere to store the memory because the alcohol interferes with that. But if you're unconscious, if you're really in a coma, um, you can't even build the model. However, if you're having a near-death experience and this whole narrative is going through your head, you're not unconscious. Uh, if you were, the whole thing should be completely confused. If you're unconscious, the definition of unconsciousness is you cannot experience anything. So what the heck is going on with the near-death experience? Uh, your memory, when you come out of it, is vivid. People universally talk about, I'll never forget it. It's like it happened yesterday, clear as a bell. This is what happened. It makes sense. It may not make sense in, in the um, way that you, you know, rational people would say you don't have a conversation with a dead person. You had a near-death experience and you were talking to people who had died. That doesn't make sense. But the conversations make sense and they make sense in their appearance and people act con congruently, they, uh, congruously. It's, it's, uh, it's not like Alice in Wonderland <laughs> where people are too big or too little or they're doing crazy things. It's just the whole context of it is different. Uh, it should be impossible, given our definition of unconsciousness, it should be impossible to have a near-death experience, to have that consistent, clear, vivid, congruent narrative, and it should be impossible to retain it in memory by definition of unconsciousness. Like the guy who had the heart attack and the stroke and he came out of it two weeks later from a coma, blind and paralyzed, he had had widespread damage to his uh, cerebral cortex. Those that would prevent him from having these experiences and it would prevent him from formulating memories of it. But he had a vivid memory of a near-death experience. It was coherent and logical. Should have not been able to have it in the first place. Should not have been able to create a memory of it. So this confounds our understanding, our scientific understanding of how the brain works. Is uh, the near-death experience still a function of the brain, but a function of the brain that's been altered? Brain function is affected by physiology. In a, in a, uh, a head injury, um, your whole uh, memory is often gone, chunks of it. But brain function is also affected by psychology. Uh, you would expect the near-death uh, experience to um, depend on a person's mental st state, their mental health, or if they had, uh, I don't know, other mental state, 
can't think of a good example. Well, you know, stroke. Or if uh, they were culturally like super religious or uh, not predisposed because they were an atheist. They didn't believe in this sort of stuff, highly critical of spiritual tendencies doesn't seem to matter. doesn't seem to have any effect at all on the rate of having near-death experiences happen, on the consistency of the experience. So he postulates some scenarios. Is the near-death experience due to drugs that have been given during the medical uh, condition that the person is in? Is this why they're having these weird hallucin hallucinogenic type experiences. I'm not going to go through this because it's just another description of someone going down a tunnel and seeing a light and, and uh, many of the drugs that they would have given you in the hospital would have dull your capacity to come up with a logical narrative. They would have prohibited you from being um, capable of logical conversation. And none of that seems to be happening in these near-death experiences. So then he asks a question that I think I hear all this all the time from medical personnel. Is it due to anoxia, uh, uh, deprivation of oxygen to the brain? So the temporal lobe is the part of the brain that is involved in emotion. And it responds to a drop in oxygen. It's very severely affected by a sudden drop in oxygen. And it's also where your memory is formed. Pilots are tested in the process of their training. Uh, they have induced anoxia. Uh, to prepare them, but they don't have near-death experiences. They get unconscious and they get confused from being deprived by oxygen, but they don't have near-death experiences. And then they did this experiment with um, medical students. This is pretty funny. He, his, the way he, that he tells the story is pretty hilarious. He's, uh, you know, probably was trained in, I don't know, the 30s and 40s maybe. And he's a bit dismissive about how mamby pamby medical training is now. You know, <laughs> they're so they they have such a uh, white glove treatment of these medical students. When I was a lad, <laughs> they were um, given spirometers, breathing tubes, that deprived them of oxygen and helped to build up carbon dioxide. And then they were supposed to be writing. And later, they would observe how the, their motor control and their clarity of thought diminished as their uh, blood oxygen level dropped. And it was really important for them to get a, a view of what that was like. So when you are deprived of oxygen, you have no insight. You have no clear, coherent vision. Your perception fragments, you become confused, and you lose motor ability. This is not what happens in a near-death experience. This is the farthest thing from the truth. Then they tried this uh, test with hypercarbia, too much carbon. And uh, the, high, the, <laughs> the problem with this is, this doesn't happen in the hospital because it is a relationship in the blood that has to do with low oxygen and they don't let your oxygen get low and so you're not letting your carbon get out of whack either and hypercarbia uh, it induces muscle spasms and uh, it it's possible that hypercarbia and near-death experiences could trigger similar physiological uh, structures and functions. Um, it, it, there is a possible correlation there, but there are other things that hypercarb hypercarbia does 
that you never see in a near-death experience. So they have to eliminate it as a possibility because they're not getting the telltale signs that they would witness otherwise. So it's the near-death experience and hallucination. Uh, it is, <laughs> I mean, by definition. Uh, drugs, mental illness, high temperature, there's a thing called hypnagogic hallucinations related to sleep. Um, bereaved people often have hallucinations. This is fascinating. Bereaved people, at least they're going to call it hallucinations, often will see their lost loved one in a crowd, in public someplace, at a distance, uh, crossing the hallway at the end of the room swear they've seen them, absolutely swear they've seen them, and then go up and realize, oh, it's not them at all. Really interesting. So our near-death experiences, uh, here, let me see if I should read this to you. It would be easy to categorize near-death experience as a hallucination. By definition, that is what it is, a vision which the experiencer believes to be real, but which has no basis in external reality. Over 20% of our sample of people were ill and would have been running a high temperature, but describing this near-death experience as a hallucination does nothing to explain the underlying mechanism, and it leaves many of the old questions unanswered. Why should everyone have more or less the same hallucination in the same circumstance across cultures and time? You're in a car accident, you had a heart attack, you're under anesthesia, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, drown, but you're all having exactly the same hallucination. It doesn't make sense. Although some experiences may clearly be hallucinations resulting from illness or drugs or psychological factors, uh, as an explanation, this runs up against the same difficulty we've come across before. Brains which are disorganized so that consciousness is lost do not produce coherent hallucinations. One is again driven back to asking how lucid experiences can arise in the disorganized brain of an unconscious person. So is it endorphins? And, or endorphins are brain opiates, naturally occurring brain opiates. But you don't find near-death experiences in everybody who's doing opiates, drug users, etc. And they don't think that this is endorphins because not all people who produce endorphins have near-death experiences. You can't induce them by taking opiates. And when they're naturally occurring opiates, um, only a certain percentage of people will have them. Interestingly enough, people with grand, grand mal seizures, produce enormously high levels of endorphins, they don't have near-death experiences. Uh, can we stimulate the brain to induce a near-death experience? They've discovered that right temporal lobe damage causes what's called amusia, that uh, you lose your pleasure music. Isn't that weird? Uh, this guy injected sodium pentothal into the right brain and uh, people lost their ability to follow the melody. And they induced it into the left brain and they lost their ability to understand the words. And so they had people singing in a choir and, and I can't imagine this, had them inject, I guess, people in a laboratory in a room. And they inject one part of the brain and they couldn't carry a tune. But if they injected the other part of the brain, they couldn't remember the lyrics. Also, this has to do with the temporal lobe. So those beautiful sounds of songs, of music and everything coming from near-death experiences, does that have some weird activity going on in the temporal lobe? Hard to say. Often, uh, they'll keep a patient awake during brain surgery to map something, and they know that the temporal lobe is associated with emotion. And interesting, this I think this is so fascinating. If you hold your telephone to your left ear, 
because of the um, emotional reaction of the temporal lobes, if you hold it to your left ear, you're going to have more um, empathy for the people you're talking to. I don't know why on the left side, but if you hold it to your left ear, it stimulates your right lobe, I guess because the emotion comes more from the right temporal lobe. So if you put it on your left ear, you know everything's reversed in your brain. You hold it to your left ear, it's going to stimulate your right temporal lobe. You're going to have more empathy for the people you're talking with. So if you've got a difficult relative and you really desperately want to not get in a fight, hold the phone on your left ear. I'm not kidding. I mean, that's actually true. And they say that uh, near-death experiences are so difficult to express in words. Well, words come from the left hemisphere of the brain. And near-death experiences seem to be more associated with the right side of the brain. And is that why they're difficult to describe in words? Because they're not associated with the word part of your brain. We know that the right part of the brain um, can be involved in mystical experiences. So. Uh, is there a connection? There's not an answer here. He's asking these questions. He's saying these are the things that, you know, we need to figure out a way to study it. So chapter 15 is about what he calls mind models. And uh, what we know about near-death experiences is that not everyone who is dying has one, and not everyone... Um, The opposite is true, too. <laughs> I'm getting myself tied up in knots. It goes both ways. Uh, we know that mood disorders change brain function and that unhappiness can actually trigger a near-death experience. But the question is, is, you know, is it a near-death experience or is this really misperception of a dream? Dreams require, here's the difference, dreams require organized, and functioning brain processes. And as we know, many near-death experiences happen after injury, <coughs> excuse me, some sort of damage to the brain. Dreams can happen when you've got certain areas of your brain messed up. If it's only a dream, why do so many people have all the same dream? Because of the consistency of the experience of the near-death experience astoundingly alike. Individual people's dreams are rarely the same as near-death experiences. Uh, in, a, in a dream, the sense of the person is not well defined. And the strength of emotion of a near-death experience is rarely in a dream. And it lasts much more rare for the storyline of a dream, the actual events of a dream, and the emotion of a dream to last the way near-death experiences do. Now, for some people, they do. Look at Ellie Dreams Down Under. That's a good one. But not for everybody. Near-death experiences, uh, are they really uh, the product of an enormous fear of death? Uh, interestingly enough, even if you go into it with a fear of death, you come out of it without a fear of death. So what's that all about? Uh, there's that fear of death that is placated by the near-death experience, but not in a religious sense. It's very strange. It's like the experience itself is reassuring, but it not consistent with religious beliefs. For example, the, the life review. There's not that sense of judgment and the sense of personal choice to go back or stay. That's not consistent with most religious beliefs. Uh, there's even um, near-death experiences that happen often for people who die suddenly. So they're not sitting around um, stewing about death, and yet they'll still have a near-death experience and come out of it with no fear. 
but they're not going into it with a fear, an anticipation of fear, I guess is more like what I should be saying. So is it genetically programmed? Uh, why doesn't everyone have one? Why are they uh, sometimes occurring even when you're not dying? Um, is it a type of disassociation? They seem too um, developed and real, internally real, uh, in comparison to true disassociation. They don't fit the scientific uh, paradigm. Uh, they're inconsistent with physical or psychological uh, phenomena having to do with disassociation. Are they a mystical experience? And, uh, interestingly enough, they did a survey in England and they found out that mystical experiences are way more common as people report having them. Like up to 65% of the population claims that they've had mystical experiences. <laughs> this is not what they were expecting. And in America, it's 75%. Um, it, claims of mystical experiences, this will blow your mind, claims of having a mystical experience are actually lower in religious people. Is this because it's frowned upon and they're afraid to talk about it? Hard to say. But if you don't love this book yet, here's the reason to love it. This is a quote in the book. Dr. Fenwick quotes our dear friend, William Butler Yeats. This book is called Vacillation, this poem. My 50th year had come and gone. I sat a solitary man in a crowded London shop, an open book and empty cup on the marble tabletop. While on the shop and street I gazed, my body of a sudden blazed, and 20 minutes more or less it seemed, so great my happiness that I was blessed and could bless. And why he put this poem in, he says, when something occurs so commonly that we can assume it's a normal part of human experience mediated by brain structure common to everyone, this sudden precipitation into a different form of consciousness is what Yates is describing. Just ordinary day sitting, staring into space, and you go into some sort of visionary state. I'm very excited that he quoted Yeats. So religions have uh, esoteric methods to experience these sort of transcendental realities, meditation, uh, people walk labyrinths, you know, all card kinds of ways of inducing a uh, visionary occurrence. Um, Occam's razor, the easiest explanation is the most likely. New death, uh, near death experience and mystical experiences probably share a similar brain mechanism. I mean, it just makes sense. Uh, is there a connection between near death experiences and the mystical experience, psychic ability, and temporal lobe function? Now, there's a, an experiment that needs to be performed. Near death experiences um, at the time of dying and close to dying, and near death experiences at other times. Uh, have some commonalities and some perceptual differences. It's uh, less common to have an out-of-body experience or the experience of vivid colors and music and sound if your near-death experience is not related to being near death. So if you're just walking down the street, it's going to be less vivid. Why is that? But still, they happen when uh, people are brain damaged and unconscious. That seems impossible. Is this just the description of a normal human experience and we're just inadequate to understand it right now? We don't have the experience or the knowledge. So chapter 16, the dying of the light. Ah, <laughs> and now we have Dr. Fenwick. I love, he's very fond of poetry. I think that's <laughs> wonderful. Dylan Thomas, here we go. We, need, we tend to share Dylan Thomas's view that death is something to be fought every step of the way. Do not go gentle into that good night. 
old age should burn and rave at close of day. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. So don't go down without a fight. <laughs> that was my part of the poem. Uh, he makes a very persuasive argument against this in the video that I saw of him. And if you get a chance to watch it, it's so good. It's uh, a difficult subject, death, for many people. Oh, this, I think, this is the chapter that may be difficult for some people. He's talking a lot about death here. And I know we've been talking about near-death experience, but he's talking about the practicalities. Not physical manifestations, but the practicalities. Uh, until very recently, you know, we're talking about mid-80s. Very recently, previous to that, it was considered bad form to talk about cancer. You didn't mention it. And AIDS, we weren't, weren't supposed to talk about it. Uh, doctors traditionally are very bad with the subject of death. Uh, it's a reminder of their fallibility. I mean, uh, the kind of personality attra attracted to medicine is often a problem solver. And if they can't solve the problem, they failed. And it's very difficult. Um, he approached, Dr. Fenwick approached one doctor who had ICU and the, you know, wanted to interview patients and talk with them about their near-death experiences and he said, we don't have near-death experiences in my ICU. <laughs> uh, they equate them with professional incompetence, with failure. They force doctors to re-examine their own beliefs. Sometimes that's hard. They tend not to be quite so introspective. Most doctors don't want to hear about them from their patients. Funnily enough, nurses are far more receptive. And I would suggest on YouTube, there's a series of videos where they interview, I believe they're all in England. I don't know if he's associated with this because I read, I saw these videos a long time ago, but they're, they're still there. They interview nurses and caregivers in hospitals about their dying patients. Fascinating. I would recommend that. Uh, most people who go through this want to talk about it. They want explanations. They don't get them, and they often get turned away with ridicule or scorn, or people tell them they're crazy or they were dreaming, and they learn to shut up. Counseling the dying is not a skill that's usually taught. And often what happens is people talk about this and the doctors medicate them. <laughs> Just... <laughs> Uh, obviously, they need a sedative. <laughs> so let's see here what's on this page. Oh, it's just a description of a doctor brushing a patient off. I know we don't need to go into it. I mean, I, I'm sure you've all had that experience one, for one reason or another. Uh, often family and friends uh, pull somebody back and... Uh, so the near-death experience is a spectrum. Is it, is it uh, part of a larger journey? Is it part of a process that, as Dr. Fenwick believes, we should be teaching from young age, grade school? We should not be afraid to talk about it. We should not be afraid to discuss our fears. We should not be afraid to discuss the mystery of it. We fear the unknown, and we're so aware of all that we would be leaving behind, it makes it very difficult, and it seems that at the point of death, according to near-death experiences, none of that matters to anybody anymore. Uh, but people are really reluctant to face death. They won't even make a will. And in ancient religions, saints had no possessions, so that if they died suddenly, it would be easy to prepare them for death and they wouldn't be a burden to anybody. Uh, so he asks, if you drop dead tomorrow, would your relationships be in good repair? That's what you need to worry about. Do you have a will? Do you have your personal papers in order? Do you have funeral plans? After reading this book, I'm going to talk to my husband about that. He doesn't know that. Don't tell him. Uh, but just not necessarily orchestrating your own funeral from the grave but providing for the cost of a cremation or a burial. That kind of situation is very difficult for family, very difficult for people. It would be a mitzvah. You would be doing a good thing. 
He says, uh, do you have a personal philosophy that helps you to face death easier? It's much as we might squirm about it. This is a hard subject for me too. But it's really good to face it. It's really good to start asking yourself these questions and try to figure out where, where you fall, what you think, you know, what you believe. Uh, then he offers some advice. Uh, if somebody loves dying, there's only one thing that matters, he says, and that's that you're there, that you're there for them. And if you have somebody that you love who's dying of a, a disease where it's, you know, they're at home and it's lingering, he says, create a peaceful, cheerful environment, leave as much control as possible for the person who's dying, but take cues from that person about how much they want to talk. Don't put out cues that you don't want to talk, that you're uncomfortable. Don't torture them about it, but make them aware that you're open. Take the time to say the unsaid, like I'm sorry, or I forgive you, or thank you. Think about what you want to say, both for yourself, if you should die, and for the people around you who may be dying. And remember that someone who's unconscious may still be able to hear and feel. So hold their hand, talk to them. And he says better to have a death room crowded with people than crowded with machines. Technology is usually, he said, in his experience, technology in a sick room of a person who's dying is usually for the benefit of family and relatives and friends who are having trouble accepting death and letting go. Many people prefer to die at home. I did some research because he had statistics and I thought these statistics might be different and I was right. Uh, they've increased 30% since COVID. Part of that is people are afraid to go to the hospital. They choose to stay at home. But people are also beginning to recognize the benefits. Scandinavia, 90% of people in, in 1987, 90% of the people died in the hospital. And in 1987 in England, 63% did. But then I, I had a really hard time getting these statistics. It was unbelievable. But 2021, in the U.S., 80% of people prefer to die at home, but only 20% do. It's like home birth. <laughs> Believe me, I know about that. Uh, the hospital staff uh, often are too busy and too limited. They can't answer your emotional, psychological, and social needs. Um, but hospice can, they're trained for that. And a lot of times people prefer the hospital because they're concerned about pain control, but that's addressed these days. That doesn't, that's not the, an issue these days. Often um, it's helpful to encourage the dying before they're in really a, a state where they're incapable, encourage them to meditate uh, on the spiritual journey that they're on. So we need to accept that near-death experiences happen and that they cause people great emotion and that the dying need our support. And <clears throat> chapter 17 is called What the Dying Tell Us. Uh, and this is really interesting. This woman, her mother was dying. Suddenly she looked up at the window and seemed to state intently, stare intently up at it. And she suddenly turned to me and said, Pauline, don't ever be afraid of dying. I've seen a beautiful light and I was going towards it. It was so peaceful. I really had to fight to come back. The next day when it was time for me to go home, I said, bye, mom, see you tomorrow. She looked straight at me and said, I'm not worried about tomorrow and you mustn't be either, promise me. Sadly, she died the next morning, but I know that she had seen something that day which gave her comfort and peace when she knew she had only hours to live. Uh, deathbed visions are really common and uh, a lot of early Christian stories uh, where people see uh, relatives or friends 
in the room before they die. And I, I won't go into it, I won't belabor it too much, but I, I'll tell you that my own grandmother told me she was in labor and uh, they had babies at home. This is in the wilderness in Ireland in the 1920s. And uh, the doctor was a drunk. This is a small village in the middle of nowhere. The doctor was a drunk and he didn't know what he was doing. He was incompetent anyway. And she labored far too long. And it ended with the baby being stillborn and my grandmother almost hemorrhaging to death. So they got the situation in hand and she was upstairs in bed and they had her sort of tucked in and left her and she said that she opened her eyes and there was a bright like spot of light in the corner of the room with a being in that bright light and she looked at it and reached out to it and when she did, she was so weak that her hand fell and hit a bedside table. And some object fell off the table. And the sound alerted my grandfather. And he took the stairs several at a time, running upstairs. And she was not breathing. And he took her by the shoulders and shook her, screamed at her name and she woke up and she said she wanted to go to the light so sounds like a near-death experience to me um, but these sorts of things are very common uh, you'll see el the elderly when they're dying just of old age uh, will looking at things that aren't there and you know people who have no dementia they're fine but they're seeing something that isn't visible to the rest of us. I wouldn't say they're hallucinating. I'm, I would say that they're aware of a different dimension. Kind of the, in the same way that newborn babies are, and if you spend any time with newborn babies, you know what I mean. And in the same way that uh, dogs are too. So in 1977, they did a study of 5,000 doctors and 5,000 nurses and uh, they asked about deathbed visions of patients and they received information back. There were two sorts, visions of nature and visions of people coming to help them. In the United States, the people coming to help were usually relatives and friends. In India, they were usually religious figures. So Dr. Fenwick interviewed carers in hospices and nursing homes and uh, in palliative palliative care in England and Ireland and Holland and I think that's what I saw on YouTube and had a wide variety of experiences with dead relatives and close friends coming to comfort and help. Then there's the subject of deathbed coincidence where you suddenly have a realization that someone close has died who didn't even know they were sick and then you find out at that moment they died. Also they uh, have these incidents of seeing something leaving the body and that's been documented this sort of energy field or, or fog or a light leaving the body or a light around the body of the sick person they there's such a thing as mechanical failures clock stop that song my grandfather's clock that actually is derived from a recognized reality this really does happen clock stop animal behavior is weird um, they may think they see old pets. They're very comforting. They're not a dream. And they appreciate it. It's a relief for them to be able to talk about it. And carers swear that these are not drug-induced hallucinations. They're very different. And I know what they mean because I've seen both. And a drug-induced hallucination is often accompanied by paranoia and anxiety and uh, dopiness, to name a few. These sorts of experiences are clear and cogent, and there's a great happiness, or relief, or familiarity. Very different. 
so the question is, is this just all a big coincidence? Is this just all, we're making it up? And his argument is, well, does that matter? If this is an experience, ill-defined, but an experience that has an emotional impact that is this great, does it really matter if it's a coincidence or whatever? Uh, support of the family this is another thing that he talks about quite a bit it's really important to, to provide support for family members when somebody is dying they're often left to sort of shuffle off you know and then people need someone to talk to they need a uh, shoulder to cry on so he says what's a good death you know, people talk about having a good death what's a good death he says the good death is to die as you want to die if you want to be at home with your family that's a good death. If you want to be in a hospice with professionals and you don't feel you're like a burden or whatever, that's a good death. If you want to be alone, that's perfectly fine. Um, if you want to first be able to say goodbyes or if you want to clear your mind by working on relationships, resolving conflicts. Uh, barriers to a good death basically are unresolved issues. And we really need to um, cater to the spiritual needs of people who are dying. There's not enough uh, thought in modern medicine given to that uh, sort of thing. So chapter 16 is beyond the grave. And let's see here, there's a quote. There's something beyond the grave. Death does not end all and the pale ghost escapes from the vanquished pyre. This was written by Sextus Propertius, uh, 54 to 7 BC. It's interesting. So life after death helps us to cope with the idea of death itself. It doesn't seem so scary and final. Do a near-death experience, do near-death experiences do anything to confirm the continuation of a personal consciousness after death? Uh, some non-scientific views. In science, uh, he says, in science, today's heresies may become tomorrow's orthodoxies. So it's very important that scientists never say never. <laughs> okay, so it's all right to look at near-death experiences from a wider framework and hope that science eventually catches up. If we don't have scientific explanations, and they don't, they haven't been able to do enough uh, really objective data gathering. They've done some subjective data, data gathering. And I think, I would guess that since this book was written, there's been more brain study because of MRIs and CAT scans, et cetera, et cetera. Be interesting to look into that. But on the whole, it's still somewhat of a science, a lot, a scientific mystery, but it's okay to go beyond that. And what if the mind is not confined to the brain and near-death experiences can be shared by close individuals? So I'm going to summarize this. I'm not gonna go into quite as much detail of this as I had planned to do, but there are stories of uh, people who know what's happening with close loved ones and friends that how do they know I mean how do they know that they're going through this particular moment of death or how about you get woken up in the middle of the night and your dead grandmother who you didn't know just died is standing at the foot of the bed telling you it's going to be okay people get visitations like this from the newly dead all the time before they know they're dead. This happens all the time. It's absolutely remarkable how common it is. So does this mean that the mind is non-local, that it's not attached to the brain, that it has influence outside the brain, and that it's mediated by some principle not yet identified by science, and that brain processes can affect other minds? What a shocking thought, like telepathy, or physical matter, psychokinesis. We know these things happen, so what's the explanation? Parapsychological research may provide persuasive evidence for the non-locality of the mind. A guy called Gansfield uh, did um, 
mind reading studies in sensory deprivation tanks. And a guy called Jan uh, found that minds, uh, minds were uh, af affecting a random number generator. Now they're doing these studies and they're collecting the data that this is what is happening, but they're not yet prepared to say why. Uh, they did a Mexican study where they had um, close individuals communicating with each other telepathically and they were able to document that. So memory depends on the brain and it must be independent of the brain to uh, argue that there's an individual consciousness outside of the body. There's just this inability to figure out why the brain and the mind can connect with other minds and brains and we just don't understand how. So the theory is that they're 100% separated and this would allow the sense of individual consciousness that are separate from the body and an out-of-body experience. And um, What they need to do is to be able to go in and interview hospital staff to study the anecdotal cases of out-of-body experiences from patients. Science says that during near-death experience, the brain creates the idea of being on the ceiling. But you could test this by putting things up high that can't be seen from any place but hanging from the ceiling. And they had this one case where the woman claimed she was unconscious during surgery. She was up in the ceiling. She saw a shoe on a ledge outside. She saw something on the top of the filing cabinet. Uh, they researched it later and found that those things were there. But then nobody for a long time was able to document this for sure. And it was poo-pooed and dismissed. But he said that after this book was put together uh, and before it was printed, that they did find the evidence for it and he did print it in his book uh, but he didn't have time to go back and talk to all the people and everything so let's see here there's something called a transmission theory and uh, is there a transcendent reality beyond the brain where the soul may live the brain is the transmitter there's a beam of consciousness coming outside your brain to the outside that connects with people and the brain transmits. The mind and the brain are different, but they're linked. And that sense data that comes in is transformed by the brain for transmission to an external mind. And can the mind will action and transmit to the brain? And some memory is in the brain, but large parts of memory are external to the brain. And, you know, this was believed by Carl Jung that we had a collective consciousness. So basically, I, I'm going to summarize this without quite as much detail because I don't want this to go a whole lot longer. Um, mind and brain are separate. All of this is nonsense. That's one theory. It's some kind of hallucination. There's something going on we don't understand. Mind and brain are separate. Well, mind and brain are connected, and it's nonsense the other way to look at it. Then the third possibility, mind and brain are separate, and the mind exists outside the brain, like it can exist in the environment, that there's an energy force that it can connect with. Now, Carl Jung sort of believed that. And there are others who have sort of believed it. And it's actually been the subject of enormous debate for a very long time. William James uh, had a theory. Let's see if I can find where I wrote about his theory. I thought it was really interesting. Well, there's the theory of Sir John Eccles, who said there was an interface between the brain and the mind. Then Rupert Sheldrake, who said there was mor morphic resonance, that there were energy fields that were connecting the brain and the mind. And uh, let's see here if I can find the William James one. And William James's theory was basically like the ether. And that has been a huge debate for a very long time. And it depends on who you want to believe because it's theories. There are particle physicists, advanced quantum physicists who say that they can characterize it with the formula and that there is some sort of um, energy field that we're all connected by. 
and there are people who support Einstein's theory and say that it discredits that and I read all sorts of stuff about it pro and con and finally threw up my hands in disgust because they can't agree nobody knows for sure I'm not going to come up with any kind of definitive answer here tonight it's just a huge gigantic debate and we're not going to know until further research is done that provides evidence and until then it will remain the topic of heated conversation so do near-death experiences uh, automatically support the belief in an afterlife most religions believe that we survive death and we have consequences for our behavior in this life after we die uh, judeo-christian belief is the soul is god in us the tibetan book of the dead which is very much describing near-death experiences say that the soul is reborn in the state of becoming in the bardo and that a near-death experience is not uh, death really it's a threshold into death so we know we need to feel we matter this is a psychological reality we need to feel we're part of something greater and part of a whole and not just mechanical entities it's hard for us to accept that that would be true and all of this is speculation we don't know at the moment we have not enough evidence or understanding to know the near-death experience says more about life than it does about life after death and it may tell us about the structure of the mind and the boundaries of human experience it may be a very useful experience for understanding of things that we don't realize it's it's a clue to um, for many people it's a profound spiritual experience um, but Buddhists there are Buddhists who meditate who have an exact similar experience as a near-death experience long-time meditation uh, may alter your brain processes sensory deprivation can alter your brain processes and strong emotion uh, create near-death experiences and strong emotion can do the same thing fear um, some people just are able to do it and we don't know why so we need to value this whole near-death experience thing for being uh, meaningful just the fact that it's meaningful makes it valuable and makes it significant I think is the word the best describes it. I have a little summary here if I can find it one of the people that we quoted several times about his experience says this in summary for my part I believe and accept that the truth of near-death experiences will never be known at least not this side of the grave as far as I'm concerned what happened to me made complete sense religion does not come into it but I have seen enough to understand why the concept of an almighty God came about in the minds of intelligent men I suspect that all religions of the world have the basic answers for my part I'm not religious nor do I believe in God or any divine mysterious force either benign or malevolent towards man but from what I've learned I would recommend that every human being seriously considers the possibility that death is not the end of everything there is no end but there are endless consequences <laughs> and that's the end of the book and I hope you enjoyed it I think it was really interesting I hope it wasn't unsatisfying because it did not provide answers um, as I said earlier getting a conversation going is just as satisfying for me so I hope you feel the same way and I have a few books here to augment we've done this book go back and look at the videos if you don't want to read the book you can listen to the videos when you're doing your housework embraced by the light really interesting book and then this is about reincarnation but you know all of this is related right and then oh, there are a couple of things on Amazon or Netflix uh, having to do directly with this book 
There's a book by, uh, oh shoot, Leslie Keane, K-E-A-N-E, it's pronounced Kane, but K-E-A-N-E, about near death and reincarnation. And then there's these Dr. Weiss books. Very interesting books. Also, Jess Stern, The Search for the Girl with the Blue Eyes. And Taylor Cald Caldwell, the writer, great writer. Um, and I know that those are not near-death experiences. I know that those are about reincarnation. But like I said, I feel like there's a bit of an intersection there. So thank you very much for watching. If you've stuck through it all the way to the end, good for you. Uh, I hope you are uh, okay with this being a day early. And um, I can't, I don't know what my schedule is going to be for work. So I'll either be back tomorrow and Sunday or tomorrow or Sunday. But I'll be back and we'll do cards on the book. And those should be very interesting. So if you have questions, please put them in the comments and uh, help me out here. I run out of ideas for questions. And thank you for watching. And in the meantime, slangafoil and slancha.